Welcome, welcome to all of you in, in Zoom land. I'm Robert Fishman, uh, professor of architecture and urban planning at the, Ta at the Taubman College. Uh, and we're here uh, to celebrate the publication of Anna Mershore's Polaris's book, Manhattan's Public Spaces, Production, Revitalization, Commo uh, Commodification. And it is a celebration, and it's a celebration not just of the book, but I think of more than a decade of uh, remarkable research. Uh, it's hard to think of anyone uh, at any stage of her career who better exemplifies uh, your countryman, Rafael Moneo's admonition, design, teach, write. Uh, Anna is the co-founder and partner uh, of the firm of Mochillo Polaris and Rule uh, with her husband, Jonathan Rule, a firm that uh, has established itself both in Spain and the United States, already a prize winner uh, and, and deservedly so. Uh, Anna came as a teacher. Uh, we have been so fortunate that Anna came to us uh, in 2014 as a Walter B. Sander fellow and has uh, continued now as uh, assistant professor of architecture. And finally, as a writer and researcher, uh, this is a project that began with a, an outstanding doctoral dissertation at Madrid Polytechnic. Uh, it has continued in a Spanish language publication, uh, Oasi, Oasis y Vitrinas, Oasis and Vitrines, uh, where Anna set herself the task, I think, uh, very successfully of uh, speaking to a, a Spanish speaking audience uh, familiar with uh, Mediterranean and, La and Latin American urbanism uh, to try to communicate uh, the remarkable and special creativity of uh, Manhattan urban design. And finally, uh, this uh, Manhattan's public spaces, which in a sense reverses the field that now she's coming from uh, uh, her, you know, her deep knowledge and understanding of European and especially Spanish urbanism and public spaces to communicate that special perspective uh, to an English speaking audience that is uh, of course much more familiar uh, with, uh, with New York. So uh, uh, it's a remarkable work and congratulations to you. I, I just wanna add that uh, it's characteristic of Anna's generosity that uh, you know, for most of us, you know, a, a book celebration is all about uh, shouting me, me, me from the top of the rooftops. Uh, whereas Anna uh, herself has organized this remarkable panel uh, of uh, three designer scholars who I have to say uh, have done more, I think, than anyone else to really uh, define the discourse of Manhattan urbanism to, uh, under, you know, to underline and to research the special role of Manhattan's public spaces in understanding that urbanism. Uh, and they have been generous enough to, uh, uh, you know, to, to, to agree to participate in this program. So just to, uh, to look ahead, uh, Anna herself will, will begin uh, the presentations. She'll be followed by Christine Miller, uh, professor in the College of Design at the University of Minnesota, the author of the book, uh, <coughs> Design, uh, Design on the Public, The Private Lives of New York's Public Spaces from 2007. She'll be followed by Mariana Margilovich, Editor-in-Chief of the Urban Omnibus, the online publication of the Architectural League of New York, the author of the book, The Invention of Public Space, Design and Politics in Lindsay's New York, 
from 2020. Uh, and then uh, our own McLean Clutter, always welcome on any panel, but especially welcome today as the author of Imaginary Apparatus, New York City and its Mediated Representation from 2015. After uh, Anna and our three panelists have spoken, we're going to open up uh, the, the discussion to, uh, to, to the audience. So uh, with that, Anna, we'll, uh, please, uh, pl uh, please begin. Thank you so much, Robert. So good morning and thank you so much to everybody who is joining us today before the studio. A special thank you for his generosity and his super kind words, which I don't deserve, uh, and for this introduction. And thank you, a great thank you to our panelists, Christine, Marianne, and McLean for joining this book discussion and sharing with us their, uh, their work in relation to design, politics, media, and redevelopment of public space in a unique city as it is New York. In order to start this book presentation, I would like to explain a little bit where it comes from. This project stems from a research initially done while working in my dissertation at the ETSAM in Madrid, many, many, many years ago, <laughs> which later has been adapted into English with an intent of framing the topic of the transformation of public space in Manhattan from a European perspective. The point of departure for this project is a reflection on the following statement. Making architecture is an accumulative activity. Cities, as we know, are shaped of layer after layer, generation after generation, project after project. However, the accumulation of all this activity is not free of conflicting interest, influences, and opposite agendas. Contradiction and complexity is problematic for any other context. But in particular in Manhattan, this is translated, this complexity and contradiction, into opportunity. In Manhattan, the search, for, the search sorry, for a shared vision has never been the case. Its unique building density, its geographic limitations, and the maximization of private space under the grid, uh, under its grid, uh, makes this example contrary to all the expectation and an expecting testing ground for public space innovation. As a European, I believe the challenge which led me to initiate this book was not, so, was not only the curiosity of diving into a set of good projects, but more importantly, in understanding how this accumulative activity contribute into an opportunistic tool an opportunistic tool able to strengthen social networks, spatial systems, and everyday language and imaginary. So as a point of departure, the book focuses far from the small scale, but, from, uh, but focuses at the beginning on master example of architecture with a great contribution to the public realm. This is a study of post-World uh, War II generation of projects able to displace all ideas and obsolete zonings that used to benefit the private sector in exchange for a public focus. This is a great shift in the protocol of making a city, a city which is no longer interested in individualist buildings, but instead on projects with a public commitment with their surroundings. It is a moment with the built environment, which the built environment, sorry, reflect the feeling of a country united after a terrible war. And when Robert Moses, the New York City Planning uh, Commissioner for almost 30 years, will state the following. Now, public and private were not at odds anymore. In contrast, without public enterprise and public works, as well as public law and regulation, all private enterprise will not be as healthy and unattractive. This is a very important statement that the book unpacks as a chronological structure between two key administrations and key moments of New York City history. 
I always like to compare these two figures because I feel myself that they they are like these two tiny Napoleons <laughs> that New York has. That I mean that is a frame uh, framework between acid modernization post La Guardia, post uh, Fiorello La Guardia era, and the city reconstruction uh, post 9/11 under Bloomer's tenure. Two majorities which stitches together three periods of the evolution of Manhattan collective space, Manhattan collective realm, during the past decades that the books unpack in the end to the following. Its production, the production of, of, of the collective, its revitalization and its commodification. The first part of the book, the production of public space, is understood as a deliberate openness in the city thanks to the alliance between modern architecture with corporate capitalism. A delicate point of departure post La Guardia's administration when the monolithic and apparent unbreakable uh, grid starts physically and metaphorically to erode. As an example of this, the book highlights the street wall of the once considered most coherent avenue of the country, Park Avenue. Suddenly, this avenue is fragmented by Lever House and later by Seagram Building. These two buildings, although having in common the urban gesture of breaking the avenue, they have opposite architectural approaches. While Lever House acknowledged Park Avenue direction with its first two floors, the turn of its tower, 90 degrees, defined a great amount of open air space, introducing a void in the wall that defined the avenue. In addition to this, its architect Gordon Bunshaft's contribution did not end here. He was so brave to replace the basement of the tower and raise it above the street level, disconnected it from the sidewalk. Lever House introduced here for the first time in the city the concept of usable public space, a garden and a, ga and a gallery to be used by the public and promoted by a private entity. In the case of the Siram building, Miss approach was different. We all know that he provided a setback on the off the tower in relation to the avenue. The main tower was set back and centered in relation to the plaza, facing the avenue as a scenic frontage with a timeless symmetry that dignified the strength of the whole. Miss Plaza stood up positively, very, very positively, uh, by critics and by the public, by the users. And against all expectations, this subtle change of height between the plinth and the sidewalk offer an ideal curbside location. The higher perspective of Miss Green Marmol's parapet offer a convenient close vantage point for, for a break from work or even a break a break from, from the city, from the city itself. But what is more interesting is like this subtle difference of height provide a certain introspection in relation to the passersby who are in the sidewalk, a degree of intimacy, which is perhaps one of the most valuable assets that the plaza brings to Manhattan, an atmosphere more closely to the more intimate and close spaces of Miss courthouses at the beginning of his career back in Germany than his later urban spaces in the United States. On the contrary, Leverhouse Semicolor Plaza provides an intimacy through an atrium co-planner with the tower reception, which unfortunately doesn't introduce an unexpected, an unexpected vista back to the city. This is a contemplative garden that although physically is connected, perhaps too much metaphorically is disconnected to the surrounding city. Here in River Plaza, the pedestrian has to investigate beyond the sidewalk. First, they need, to, they need to notice the presence of the patio, and second, they need to change their way to access to it. This incipient game of viewing, of voyeurism, to see and not to be seen, that happens in Seagram, here it doesn't take place. But despite the errors and successes of both of these projects, Ricardo Escofidio will state the following. With these two projects, it is the first time that architecture brought something to the city that didn't exist before. I mean, brought something to the urban design that didn't, brought, didn't exist before, which is something really difficult to achieve with, architecture, with an architectural mechanism. 
as a result, the Zigram success uh, spread, the Zigram success plaza spread as a formula all over the city. This was a revolutionary spatial strategy that the city appropriates, I mean, the city really appropriates Zigram's innovation into the so called plaza bonus a legal mechanism which allows free additional square feet of the developing space for each square foot of open space provided in a plaza. As you can imagine, the buildable area grew exponentially. In some areas, in different areas of the city, the buildable area grew almost a 20%. As the critic William Holly White, William Holly White wrote, sorry, the bonus proved almost to be an embarrassing success. However, the extenuation of the use of this incentive regulation revealed a fact that, um, that it was the following, the overwhelming need for more open space in the city. In the second part of the book, the corporate plaza lay a groundwork for the sensibility and revitalization of the collective realm in the city. A new political agenda under a refreshing young Republican mayor, John Lindsay, who after 20 years of the Democrats' mayors post La Guardia, supported a refreshing new orientation of making public works. His 10 year, his Lindsay 10 years, promote the small scale via the intelligent economic investment and key participation of, this, of specialized facilities, communities, and investors. As a European, one sees this moment of New York City history as, some, as something essential urban in character. But although the main reason for this sensitive approach is purely economic, under Lindsay administration, there is no money for big investment, and the city is going to face a great and a, a really, really serious deficit. In fact, this alternative, this alternative to make city and especially took advantage of the grid's missing teeth, which was the reconciliation of the city's intimacy in a context where innovative playgrounds and pocket parks grew disassociated from the commercial and the real estate logic. Beyond their sensibility, plazas, pocket parks, and playgrounds of rigid geometries and new materials do not have a great evolution in the city. We, I mean, I mentioned that I mean the city is going to face a great deficit. Are the is the beginning of the 70s, but this lack of investment and overwhelming city deficit led the most led that most of these projects were finally transformed <clears throat> into other designs that had easier maintenance and management. And then, although this disaffection of modern post-war design can be seen by some as an abandoned uh, doorstep, it is also for others an opportunity to plan and to refresh and to bring to the open public space into a new and updated context, as it is in the recent case of the Rock Park. This small playground in the core of Battery Park City opens up a move toward the so-called alternative modernism, a post-industrial vision of a pre-established nature. As Professor Anita Berret Becia points out, we often lack the capacity of read landscape as contemporary because we don't expect modernism to use natural elements a design innovation which take advantage of the tension between artificiality and nature, an approach where nature, even if it's a constructive nature, becomes public space, and public space becomes this constructive nature. But the process of public space redevelopment rooted in innovation refreshing physical infrastructure and the deep implication of authorities, communities, and investors is not, however, as it happened in Tierra Park, the entire explanation for the collective space revival in New York City. In examining, for example, these two waterfront projects, Battery Park City and Gantry Plaza State Park in Queens, it is also important to reflect on the impact that the transformation of an open space has on the interests and demands of the inner city, an inner city immediately adjacent to it. So in examining these two examples, the immediate question that is on the table is the following. Does an innovative waterfront ensure an innovative architecture for the 21st century city? 
And the answer, unfortunately, is no. In both Battery Park City and Gantry Park, all these promising assets fell short in developing a thrilling architecture at the level of their sophisticated urban designs, both pointing to an identical real estate agenda, which was simple and monolithic, to quickly raise the value of real estate, of real estate beyond the water's edge of the city. This is a target fueled by the former Bloomberg's administration vision for a greener city fed by special funds and federal economic, economic support after 9-11. But also it is uh, a target which is later embraced with uh, that the Blasio's administration embraced for his affordable housing agenda. A moral commitment toward the waterfront, which, however, overlooks the unstoppable increase of land value by replacing low rent workers and factories with high rent professionals and office buildings. Lastly, the book interrogates the commodification of Manhattan's public area a period of frictional identities, antagonist encounters with its local population. This is a moment in the city when private impetus toward public investment grows. But the question, the important question, which is on the table is the following again. Who can afford the cost and production of open public space in a city, in the city? One way to answer this question is via a new generation of super tall buildings, which one, on one hand have been transformed the character of the neighborhood forever, but which on the other hand have contributed towards hundreds of billions of tax revenue dollars. A controversial approach which promotes sensitive public space amenities with a depredatory real estate mechanism. From this perspective, what at first may appear a great opportunity for the city to revitalize underused utilize common spaces and take advantage of the air rights, for example, an obsolete infrastructure, as we as the book uh, reads in Lincoln Center for the Performing Arts and uh, the High Line, the reality is that this project has accelerated a process of commodification and luxury in the city a celebration of a special initiative that unfortunately showcases the lack of new ideas, but the cannibalization of the city's own past, which is irrelevant to the basic needs of less privileged neighborhoods in other areas of the city. This is an urbanism that for some scholars does no longer constitute a city. As the late Michael Sorkin highlighted, rather it produces a kind of area strip hyper city, a city which billions of citizens, all who will consume, is a city of consumers, but not residents. A utopia of transients, a place where everybody is just passing through. A true tragedy for the urban commons of our times, as author David Harvey points out when he writes, the way in which a priori stimulating everyday neighborhood life has been interrupted by predatory practices and real estate uh, lack any social uh, imagination. This is an open debate which opens uh, out the difficulties to accommodate private property interests while mitigating their impact in a long term. At the time that this project do hold the promise to be great sources of economic support for the public investment in other areas of the city, as, we, as I mentioned, they also lack the inclusion of local agents. A key aspect when it comes to strengthening or weakening the link between recently built interventions and their surroundings. Their projects, these are projects which represent a counter to new, uh, a counterpoint to the New York's ethos of a city whose rich and sophisticated urban life is dependent on an extremely heterogeneous mix of programs and a multiplicity of vibrant street life, rather than a central core or rather than single formulas. From this position, the book addresses a set of questions that invite us to reflect on new alternatives to bridge the gap between public and private enterprises. The fact that these new public amenities sprang from former infrastructure, infrastructure says a lot about the current moment in New York City's evolution. It is a city that had once been pioneer 
so of so many technological and urban planning solutions, but it's a city that now is a str a struggles reinventing itself and the time and, and this time makes obvious the need to leave room for a true inclusivity of the agents who are behind the decision making, the agents who are behind the planning, the imagination and the representation of a collective realm for all. As a conclusion, from the innovation and public space that the corporate plaza once offered, to the opportunity that the small recreation spaces took advantage of, and finally, the, city, the city's commodification of its underused space led the book to defend a vision of a collective Manhattan, a unique vision reminiscent of huge ferries, fantastic metropolis of tomorrow from 1929. A very early, early representation of a city where New York City was not envisioned as an accumulative and homogeneous mass of individual buildings, as the planning of its grids pretend the city to be. But instead, it is a vision, it is a very contemporary vision of a multi-level whole of interconnected projects, projects which are dependent one from each other. A view of a, contact, of a constant connection and a precedent of a new generation of projects that until today use opportunistic mechanisms that bet for engagement, not for separation. The bet not to remove from the urban environment, but a connection directly to it. This is a book, I would like to finish with this note. This is a book which reflects on a city, key connector between land and water, an historical hub of trade, and an interface between the outside world and the country which lead us to reflect on the consequences of urban regeneration of politics, the, the displacement of former activities and the exponential increase of land value, uh, something that is not foreign, unfortunately, from any other uh, uh, city that we live in. A complex and yet contradictory scenario, which is a remarkable window into the future of North American contemporary urban design, which is still open ended and still um, is unfolding. I'm very, but there is much, um, a lot more to, to say about it. So, thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. And now we are going to jump into uh, Christine's presentation. So, Christine, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to stop sharing your screen and you can share yours. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, Anna, so much for this invitation um, and especially for your presentation. Um, Reading your book, on the one hand, it's, it's so compelling because of the detail and the connections that you draw across policy and law and history and place. Um, I find your drawing so compelling to look at. It's really a window into these spaces that I wouldn't have otherwise. What I find particularly compelling, um, in addition to this um, really thoroughly re researched and rich descriptions of specific public spaces in New York is your use of image. And I wanted to start today by um, thinking about the presentation that you just gave um, and the way that you have juxtaposed um, historic images um, of policymakers and people experiencing places of children in playgrounds. Um, of men cross-legged laying down in a public space um, and how you've contrasted those with images of um, people we would consider to be elite decision makers, um, sort of thinking through changes in the city. I think if the role of history is to open doors on the present, I think that this combination of deeply researched text and very a very imaginative imaginative use of juxtaposition of images reminds me in ways of the work of Susan Buck Morris, um, who was very influential for me um, in writing the book on New York. 
um, in part because of the position she takes on the role of image and aesthetics in history, um, that the aesthetic experience um, shake us out of the present so that we can imagine that a different future is possible. Um, and so I, yes. I, sorry, sorry a second. I mean, I'm afraid that we are looking at your notes instead of your presentation. Ah, I'm sorry. Let okay. me see if you, if you can share yeah. the, the other screen. Sorry, to, thank you so much for your, oh, perfect, yeah. here we are. <laughs> so, okay. so thank you, thank you. Yes, thank you, thank you. Um, so I would like to start really with an invitation for our conversation later, which is um, to, to talk more about your beautiful book and the beautiful work that you presented. Um, and, and, I, and like I said, I think it works on um, many levels. Um, and one level that just in the last, since your presentation this morning um, and looking at the images more last night um, is as this sort of window onto the present that uses the creative juxtaposition of visual imagery grounded in a very detailed history of place um, in a way that worries our imagination. And maybe this is something we can talk about again in the future or for another conversation, but I wanted to start there. Um, okay, so that was my last slide because I, I was just thinking about it um, today. Um, the book Designs on the Public, the Private Lives of New York City's Public Spaces came out in 2007, which feels like um, a lifetime away for me. Um, and um, I am very intrigued by the history of specific urban places, um, as I think everyone on the panel is today, and uh, the way that you um, sort of these rich histories that you construct. I'm interested in how they're produced and experienced and debated and destroyed and reimagined. I'm interested in the pub publics that they celebrate and exclude, how they can be and cease to be again the sites and subjects of public spheres. Um, in this book, I asked whether or not public spaces really exist at all as we imagine them by looking at six different case studies in New York, the front steps of City Hall, Federal Plaza, the New Times Square, the IBM Atrium, Sony Plaza and the public spaces at Trump Tower. At that time, back in 2007, I think that designers typically thought of public spaces as being open and accessible, typically publicly owned or officially privately owned, but open to the public, um, that there were somehow sites for um, spontaneous interactions, and that somehow they were tied to democracy, although it, we had a hard time describing what that was other than in sort of an imaginary way, um, but at least as a site for, um, at least for the site, as a site for demonstration. Um, and what I found um, is that none of these are the case. Um, public spaces, as we um, know, as others pointed out before me and have since, public spaces are bound by policies and regulations and codes of conduct. And these codes and regulations not only control what can happen on streets and sidewalks and plazas and parks, but where they occur and who can be present. In other words, who could even constitute a public for a particular public space. And so public spaces are not static entities, but rather sit at these shifting intersections of law and aesthetics and identity and representation and experience and politics. They are at best tenuous conditions rather than fixed objects. And they are also experienced by different people um, who have different opportunities in the very same moment um, in the very same space. Uh, working on this book forced me to ask a lot of questions of myself and my field of landscape architecture um, and of urban planning. So if public spaces are not as we imagine them, and if their design is only one facet of a complex and contingent physical and non-physical hybrid, what does this mean for us? What does it mean for the discipline and practice of architecture, landscape architecture and planning? Where does this very messy and contingent reality leave us? I think that if we accept the messy and contingent reality of public space, indeed of all kinds of cities and landscapes, it affords us the challenge to think broadly about our fields and about what counts as design and what counts as practice. 
a chance to think about the skills and knowledge and values we have and what our contributions might be. It also affords us the chance to ask ourselves as individuals, what is the change we wanna see in the world? What ethical relationships do we seek? If things aren't as we thought, how do we want them to be? And by things, I mean everything, all of it. What everythings are possible? At that time, my work also shifted from these sort of solo critiques of public spaces in New York to more collaborative explorations of how people were working to make change in Minneapolis and St. Paul to create places and to create ethical relationships. I was already part of Remix, which was a collaboration with Juxtaposition Arts in North Minneapolis. Um, and already thinking about um, this question of racial justice um, and how that sits within these questions of what is public and what is private, what is design, what is space, and what is the future. I encourage you to look at the work of juxtaposition arts. I don't have time to introduce them very fully today, especially to look at the work of their environmental design group. I think they are working to repair these disconnects that could connect public realms and public spaces, thinking about information equity in particular, thinking about place and justice through design, about the processes that lead to places and about the places themselves. Their work does in some cases result in new physical spaces like a new skate park in North Minneapolis, which has a really interesting history. But importantly, the processes that surround their imagining, who is imagining, how are they imagining it, their making, how these places are used, how they make and unmake and remake space is what's important. And for Juxta, the ethical principles are rooted in equity and justice, um, which means fair and not equal, the fair distribution of both benefits and costs. Um, and so Remix um, is now in its 15th, 17th year, um, and it's about bringing equity to the forefront of the Twin Cities design professions. I'm teaching two classes um, related to Remix right now, an undergrad class on design equity and a graduate class that is looking at environmental justice um, and sites along the Mississippi River. Obviously you can't read this, this is our Remix matrix, um, but when we think about bringing equity to the forefront of the Twin Cities design professions and design fields, we're thinking about young people at Juxta, we're thinking about young people at University of Minnesota, we're thinking about new practitioners and we're thinking about people like me who've been around a long time um, and are um, thinking about the next generation of leadership. From one of our um, earliest sessions together, um, this is not a community design class. It's also not a class where we're mentoring young people at Juxta. Um, this is about um, learning from the expertise within North Minneapolis um, and working to sort of um, uh, for students to understand the change they want to see in the world and what they bring to making that change happen. This is. Um, a uh, more recent project it is an open source um, sort of textbook. It's very brief. I hesitate to even call it a book, um, but it's the book that I use for the design equity class where we ask, how do things like information, health, housing, and environmental equity relate to design process um, and also design practice? And so the questions that I'm thinking about now um, is um, about how, given all that we know about justice and equity, given what we've learned about public space, how can environmental design help to create equitable cities? How does it differ from traditional design practice? How do we pay for it? How do we evaluate it? And most importantly, how do we sustain it over the long haul? Our cities didn't become inequitable overnight and remaking them as places of opportunity for everyone is gonna be a long haul. Um, most, most recently, I've been working on a project that traces um, not public space, but private space and the private spaces of my own family's homes. How do we consider these private spaces and these individual stories, these individual family relationships, births, illnesses, and deaths, and how these unfold within and under federal policies around immigration, work, housing, and education? Um, how do these as histories 
open windows onto the present. Um, as I said, juxtaposition and um, our collaboration um, around Remix has been going on for about 17 years. And so this next generation of leaders are, um, are have been stepping in um, and rethinking um, how this work happens. I invite you to look at an organization called Community Members for Environmental Justice, um, which is also related to JEXTA um, and its leaders, um, some of its leaders also come from JEXTA. Um, and I invite you to, I, I just left uh, class, we were in the middle of an online environmental justice tour of North Minneapolis and the Twin Cities. Um, and I invite you to contact CMEJ um, and um, I think work with classes to do these tours and to think about environmental justice together. Um, again, I think, um, how do we create work um, that highlights possibilities and connection and that worries our imagination and in that way that um, allows us to use history in a way that, that frees the present. Thank you so much, um, Anna, for this invitation. Thank you for your beautiful book. I've really enjoyed reading it over the last few weeks and I am excited to learn more today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christine. It has been a pleasure to, that you invite us our, our that you, uh, this, uh, you know, to jump us in this conversation. Thank you for the introduction. So now we are going to, I mean, I want to just uh, give the next step to uh, Mariana. Mariana, whenever you want, I stop sharing and you share your screen. Sounds wonderful. Um, thank you. Um, thank you, Anna, for um, passing the mic and um, more than anything for, for organizing this wonderful location and for the opportunity to celebrate um, your new book, which I found just um, so beautiful um, and, and provocative. Um, I'm excited to be here with you all to talk about um, what it is about New York City's post-war public spaces that um, has and sort of continues to justify so much collective spilled ink. Um, I, um, you know, share share with you on a real um, affection, I think, for the city's historical experiments in public space and also um, a fascination with their persistent influence. Um, and I, I think it's um, it's about the, the particular intensification there or here um, of the challenges of urbanity and collective living precisely um, in a place and at a moment that those things um, really appear increasingly precarious or, um, or possibly obsolete, right? Um, and so I, I wonder too, and um, put this out for, um, you know, for, for discussion as well, um, what they mean for us, you know, now and, and today. Um, you you ask in the in the book um, I think an important question um, you know at the end if if after a, a half century of of innovation um, right as as we'd look at it in in the private sector has the city run out of fresh ideas um, and so um, speaking of fresh ideas I um, I think we worked on our projects roughly at the same time and so um, like Christine I um, I have yet to um, to reach much um, much distance or, or disentangle um, myself from that project so I thought what I um, I would do hold on I will just share the screen um, Okay, there we go. That should do it. Okay, <laughs> um, is really to um, to bring um, I think uh, to to zoom in a little bit to um, one part of the the kind of mastered narrative that you've spun in the post war, um, and, and take a, a sort of. Um, digression and tour um, around um, some of those projects and questions and, and you know, perhaps a, uh, a, a narrative also of a, a kind of um, possible alternative future or, you know, what, what might've have, might have been otherwise. Um, so, um, 
Right. So um, we're asking about um, the the question of um, of fresh fresh ideas um, around public space in New York City. And um, so in um, in this book that that um, that I recently finished, um, I argue that that actually one of those fresh ideas um, is the idea of urban public space itself. Um, so I'm interested in or, or want to make the the case that 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 is um, an an invention that we can also locate in New York in a in a really fertile period of experimentation um, in the 1960s and early 1970s. Um, and that looking closely, you can see um, at this time and in this place how different things or things that we used to um, consider differently, like streets and parks and plazas and waterfronts, really come together to be understood as public space as such, right? Um, and thinking about, you know, uh, um, so so something that that I sort of come to think of as a, a designed environment with a socio-political function kind of insecurely attached to it. Um, so, so all these things that really weren't called or thought of as, as public space as such before, um, through a series of experiments at this time, um, and, and a series of associations that, that come out of those experiments lead us really to, to those understandings Christine was talking about, right, of public spaces, a specific physical thing that's somehow connected um, to ideas of both an inclusive urban democracy and also um, to a certain concept of individual freedom and delight. Um, and, you know, and that that specific history is really behind a, a set of ideas and assumptions that in many ways um, we find ourselves moving past, but that remain international orthodoxy um, today. Um, and so I, um, I, I put out, I guess, some of this um, history or dive into to try in part to understand um, why uh, we would assume public space serves a public good in the first place, um, and why um, we have now this this long lineage of always finding those spaces falling short, right along those axes of ownership and access and inclusivity. Um, so in this book, I, um, I approach public space. Um, I try to get away from the normative ideals of the public sphere and approach it instead in terms of what a uh, political theorist Bonnie Honig calls a public thing. Um, and she defines public things as concrete environments that interpolate us into democratic citizenship. Um, so public space is literally what we see here um, in the, the city parks official, um, I think this is in 1968, is literally um, holding it as, in his hands at this community meeting that's about the design of a, a vest pocket park, um, a sort of program of experiments that um, that you write about so so wonderfully. Um, so I'm interested in um, in how um, how these these parks and this thing is is meant to intervene in, in relations of citizenship at this particular time, and it's really part of a, a set of projects that respond to a very 1960s combination of concerns about um, on the one hand a culture of conformity and the threats um, to individuality and democracy that that um, that might bring. Um, and then on the other, coming out of the civil rights movement and subsequent social movements, this reckoning with the exclusion that's inherent in existing public spaces that have really been envisioned for a homogeneous public, right? They're supposed to be for all, um, but uh, it's a um, not now unfamiliar sort of moment of realization, um, you know, or making aware that these actually exclude vast segments of the population, um, whether that's on account of race or ethnicity or age or gender or sexuality, and they also make that exclusion visible. Um, so you look at this time, how these two concerns together motivated attempts by the professional shapers of the built environment to, to try to make urban spaces differently um, and to find ways to include specific and heterogeneous publics and also make space for some degree of self-determination and individual development in those spaces. So all of this is um, is taking place in um, in this very brief um, period that that Anna has characterized um, as a moment of revitalization um, of the city's um, open spaces in the context of, of urban crisis, um, and so we've um, you know. You, you've framed uh, framed the narrative in terms of the the role of of mayors, and it's absolutely associated with um, with Mayor John Lindsay, who um, is um, in office from 1966 to 73. 
um, and who we see um, here for in a collage for a, a cover story in Time Magazine, um, for whom, um, along with um, designers at the time, this this urban crisis is um, is conceived or sort of taken as a, a really a social and physical rupture um, in in a, a city people relationship, um, and. I, I think the this this cover story, which um, is a story titled "New York Breakdown of a City," um, sort of illustrates what's what's at stake there. Um, you have on top um, this young and diverse population, um, folks who are demanding full participation in the life of the city um, and are threatening um, disorder um, or maybe even violence if that doesn't happen. Right? We also have policemen on opposite ends of the frame, um, and on the bottom we have the the skyscrapers of Manhattan sort of jutting out at anxious angles um, while residential buildings are, are crumbling and maybe even on fire. Um, their survival being threatened by the accelerating movement of industry and corporate headquarters and white middle class residents to, to the greener pastures of suburbia. Um, and so in the face of this crisis of faith really in the city's survival and especially in its ability to serve as common ground for um, for different people is interested in how Lindsay tried to make New York City really a national model for an inclusive democracy um, and in how the city's open spaces in particular were used as a, a strategy, um, perhaps as, as you call it an, an opportunistic tool, I think it's, it's also fair to say. Um, to to really glue together this this urban and social fabric that you know in the case of the collage are literally being torn apart. Um, and so in this moment, new and, and reused open spaces are, are really um, meant to show that, that the cities for people who have been excluded from the public realm, um, and at the same time to demonstrate the, the value of, of urban life itself and contribute to an argument that the city is diverse and inclusive and, and even fun. So I, I look at how this project um, plays out through a series of, of designs um, that aren't exactly canonical today, and most of them also don't exist anymore. Um, the the first, um, I think, you know, an, an important um, progenitor to the story actually dates to, to before Lindsay's inauguration. Um, and is a new landscape um, for a, a public housing complex on the Lower East Side, where you can sort of see before the intervention um, the, the state of the critique around functionalist landscapes of urban renewal, um, where you have this open space that exists um, purely for the function of letting in light and air. Um, all the green space is, is cordoned off. And so um, there's increasingly the question of um, where people fit in, right? Where, where do kids play? Um, and a conflict around that space that's really a proxy for a larger battle about um, what status and what claims do residents have um, in a city like this, you know, are they dominated subjects or, or are they full citizens? Um, so, so at this time, um, the, the landscape architect Paul Friedberg really at the very start of his career gets commissioned to redesign um, that undifferentiated open space and, and turns it into a, a sequence of four distinct outdoor rooms. Um, most notably with an amphitheater for community gatherings and cultural events um, that doubles as a spray pool. Um, and this adventure playground, which is really the most remarkable feature of the landscape where he creates this environment um, that's really focused on children's development as, as creative individuals and a, a kind of landscape um, trajectory where children have um, agency in the built environment as they're sort of determining how they move around it instead of um, the old model of lining up to use the equipment, um, take your turn, do the move and, um, and do it again. Um, and so, so the playground is not just, you know, a kind of creative repose to this sort of boring old model, but really um, imagined and received as, as an urban microcosm and, and, and a model um, for something larger. Um, it meets with such success on the ground, it just in terms of use, um, that a couple of years later, the architects will say, as they're making the case for um, putting a public bathroom in there, it's become a real public space. 
Um, and probably um, McLean will, will go there, but the, the media reception and discussion um, of this project is, um, is so, so great. Um, I think one can't sort of underestimate the, the kind of traveling and, and repercussions and um, use of the project um, to, to propose this alternative direction. Um, and so indeed, um, this, this landscape uh, at Reese Plaza has a, a material influence on city policy when Lindsay becomes mayor a year later. Um, his administration will build other adventure playgrounds um, in Central Park and around the city. They commission studies to revisit housing plazas of urban renewal projects um, and to redesign them to, to be more like Reese. Um, they sponsor new urban design projects that will really emphasize the role of residential open space for neighborhood integration um, and really extend that model um, to, to even larger landscapes. Um, so this is another uh, Friedberg designed for Harlem River State Park where the playground and the amphitheater and the pool um, are sort of morphed into an adult landscape that's not just about extending this idea of um, play and belonging um, to grownups, but really has larger urban ambitions as well. Um, so this is a park that was meant to be a new linear city um, where collective facilities like these pools, along with new housing, um, would really promote urban identification and integration on a more regional scale. Um, and of course, we only have um, fragments of this park as, as a legacy, only, only one small part was built. Um, similarly, um, designs uh, for, for Vest Pocket Parks um, had really urban scale ambitions to recover um, right, these vacant lots to talk about the kind of empty, empty teeth um, of disinvestment into a, a citywide network of residential open space um, and, um, and create new pathways for, for participation, not just in how they're used, um, but how they're made. Um, so this is what um, the, the park of the meeting in, in question ends up looking like. Um, many of these experiments um, are seen to fail um, in a few short years. Um, they're literally abandoned for lack of maintenance and um, in the face of much larger social and economic factors. Um, but I think what's interesting is um, at the same time, they're, they're a resounding success. So um, Paley Park, for example, um, becomes really a, a textbook urban public space when there start to be textbooks for this just a few years later. And so I think um, in, in projects like the Vest Pocket Parks and, and similarly um, around um, street designs, the, the kind of experiences of political transformation or changes in citizenship in and around um, public space in this period are going to sort of conveniently um, allied into claims for, for other new designs um, to be for the people or revolutionary, even as they serve a very restricted public. Um, so we see the same thing in designs for pedestrianization in the city center. Um, another unfinished Lindsay era project um, that provides a, a direct through line to, um, to the Bloomberg years. Um, and so just um, very quickly to kind of bring us to, to that moment, um, you know, certainly in the, in the return in recent years, at least in New York of municipal attention to urban design and public space, we've really seen um, the return of very similar tactics um, employed um, to serve really exclusively the, the ends of economic development. So we see again, visions of the city as a playground, um, but a playground for tourists primarily and, and for the ultra wealthy. Um, and I think, um, I mean, I'll maybe just leave it with a sort of invitation or, or question about where that, um, where that leaves us today. Um, and especially um, after the last two years where I think once again, as in that earlier moment, we're seeing um, more clearly um, both the, the critical social and political functions of the city's public spaces and also their shortfalls. Um, and really at a moment um, that, that demands, um, you know, reimagination um, and where they sort of hang in the balance between a collective citizenship infrastructure um, and, and spaces for preserving business as usual. Um, so some, <laughs> some, some food for, food for thought. 
This is super and very wonderful, Mariana. Thank you so much for your contribution <clears throat> and your taking this idea of citizenship, uh, design, and inclusivity. I mean, looking at this period of New York City. So we are going to uh, continue with McLean. I mean, Mariana, if you do, do not mind to uh, stop sharing the screen. I'm trying. <laughs> <laughs> no worries, no worries. And this is like things of their life. There we go. Perfect, perfect. <laughs> Thank you so much. So we have our last but not least panelist, that is McLean, our chair here at the Department of Architecture. So McLean, whenever you want, I mean, the state is yours. <laughs> Thank you, Mariana, again. Okay, can everybody, everyone see that? Perfect, perfect. Very good, okay. Well, thank you, Anna, um, and congratulations again. I really, um, you know, as Mariana and Christina said, I really, really enjoyed the book. I think it's, um, it's a book, ironically, where I think an awful lot is gained in translation. I think that there's um, a certain way that, um, that you write for, uh, first, for the Spanish audience that is not as necessarily as familiar uh, with the material that has a great deal of precision uh, that then adds a lot, I think, to these spaces that, you know, some of us think we, we know quite well. Um, I learned a ton um, by reading the book, so I really appreciate it. Um, and thanks again to Mariana and Christine, um, both of you for, um, for joining us today. Um, so this is fun for me to, to revisit what, what I think of as kind of an old project. Um, and I am, I, I feel a bit of the odd one out here in that my book really isn't about public space per se, um, but it is about New York uh, and the public imagination uh, of that city. Um, so more specifically, my book, uh, which is from 2015, Imaginary Apparatus, uh, is about a relationship between New York City and its mediated representation that I argue emerged during the urban crisis in New York, um, coinciding also uh, with the Lindsay mayoral tenure, uh, overlapping very much uh, with the time that Mariana is focusing on between 1966 and 1973. Uh, and I'm interested in the kind of impact of this relationship between um, media and the city that, that I argue emerged at this time had um, in the city in the years that followed. Uh, so the book is written in two parts. Part one is called The Apparatus, uh, and it lays out the actors, artifacts, and issues involved in establishing this relationship between New York and its mediated self that I try to describe. Uh, and then in part two of the book, uh, part two is called The City, and it includes three uh, essays that identify material and architectural evidence in New York's built environment for this relationship that I describe in part one. So again, part one is, is titled The Apparatus, uh, and it begins by discussing policy created by the Lindsay administration that was intended to draw on location media production back to New York for the first time in decades. Uh, and the city did this, did this by providing tax incentives to the film industry. Uh, I mean, these kinds of incentives are, are really routine now, um, but at the time, this was very, very new. So the chapter discusses the economics of the film industry at the time uh, in relation to the city's urban economics, arguing that a symbiosis emerged between the two. And then I introduced some of the wealth of innovative urban design and plan planning that occurred within Lindsay's administration, um, spearheaded by the young architects that he uh, drew to public service uh, in a um, really kind of remarkable and unprecedented way. Um, so there's a lot of material in the time. And while the collection of urban design and planning produced under Lindsay is, is really vast and diverse, my argument is that latent within much of this work was a tendency to understand the city and really critically the public's engagement with the city in ways that reflect the aesthetic and intellectual influence of film and other visual media. And among the materials I analyze in the book in order to make a case for the mediatic nature of planning and urban design during the Lindsay administration is the 1969 plan for New York City, which is, um, these are spreads from my book, but it's the, um, this six volume uh, thing on the right. These are enormous 30 inch by 30 inch um, books. 
Uh, and I spend some time talking about the text and proposals within the plan, but I mostly focus on these proto-cinematic photo essays that compose a huge part of the plan. Um, these photo essays were assembled by a um, pretty influential documentary photographer, Charles Harbutt, um, who I had the opportunity to spend some time with before he died um, only in 2015. And these are some spreads uh, in my book reproducing some of the hundreds of photo essays in the plan. And the photo essays include work from other influential 20th century photographers like Bruce Davidson and Andre Curtis um, and many others. So I analyze and unpack um, the messaging flowing through the photo essays, arguing that the 69 plan was really written for the public as audience and that the photo essays were among the primary means through which the plan sought to communicate to that public. Uh, and then I analyze a film version of the 1969 plan uh, that Mariana also talks about a little bit in her book um, that was made for public television in New York um, titled, What is the City but the People? Um, and these are just some frame enlargements um, uh, from my book, from that film. My publishers uh, remarkably restored the film and included it in the, in the book itself. So really the core of my argument in part one is that during the Lindsay administration, New York was inviting media production to its streets while conceiving of the public's engagement of those streets through various mediatic registers, while also kind of yoking the financial interests of the city to those of the film and television industry. And so that kind of set of interrelations is what I call uh, the apparatus. So again, then in the, the second part of the book titled The City, uh, in, there are three essays describing the kind of architect some architectural evidence of the apparatus described in part one in New York's built environment. So the first essay in part two is titled Spectator, uh, and it discusses a 1972 study of the effects of New York City's incentive zoning policy uh, that, that Anna uh, writes about, um, that granted developers an FAR bonus for providing uh, plaza space at the ground level. And so Mayor Lindsay asked the urbanist and sociologist William White to conduct this study. And White focused on the plaza at the, at, uh, the Mies van der Rohe Seagram building as a kind of exemplar. And his methods entailed using uh, the use of a stationary camera and also handheld film cameras to monitor the daily activities and occupations of the plaza. So Spectator uh, contextualizes White's study within his kind of larger intellectual disposition, um, analyzes his description of the Seagram study, uh, and provides a formal analysis of qualities he may have observed with the Seagram building. And the chapter contends that because White privileged film as a medium for observation, his design, suggest his design suggestions implicated plaza spaces from which the surrounding city can be figured as a kind of proto-cinematic experience. This being an experience that would meet the expectations of urban subjects first exposed to New York through media enabled by Mary Lindsay's earlier policies. And then the second essay is titled Desire. Um, this essay discusses the appearance of historic and often blighted areas within New York in film and television in the late 1960s and early 1970s. Um, a development that would not have occurred to such an extent without the conjuncture of Lindsay's media production policies um, and specific business developments in Hollywood that I discuss in part one of the book. So the chapter connects the media exposure that was granted to historic or blighted locations to the parallel elevated cultural valuation of these areas, evident in the establishment of the 1965 New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission and later um, special district zoning policies produced by groups um, within Mayor Lindsay's administration um, that were meant to preserve historic neighborhoods. And I argue that many of these special district zoning resolutions sought to control development such that the kind of scenographic experience of the historic streetscape was preserved, which is precisely the aspect of the city being popularized in film and television at the time. So in the chapter I analyzed film, um, 
policy and mobilized media theory to argue that the spe special district zoning created a city uniquely solicitous of the desire for urban lifestyle amongst urban subjects first exposed to the city through media. Um, and then quickly I'll finish so we hopefully have some time for conversation. The, the final essay is, um, is a bit tough to summarize, um, but it's called Ecology. Uh, and it establishes a connection between the apparatus described in the first part of the book and emergent ecological thinking in Lindsay's planning commission. Uh, the essay begins with a discussion of a 1970 conference in New York City titled Restructuring the Ecology of a Great City, which was conceived by Jacqueline Robertson, who was at the time chair of Mary Lindsay's office for Midtown Planning and Development. And the keynote was the philosopher Gregory Bateson, who's one of the foremost voices in the ecological movement of the 60s and 70s. So the essay contends that Bateson's thought complemented urban design in New York in complex ways, weaving through the connected proto-ecology of real estate economics, the urban ecology of interrelated programs in the city, and what Bateson called the ecology of mind of the city's public. And the chapter includes uh, an analysis of a special district zoning resolution for Manhattan's theater district um, drafted by Lindsay's Office for Midtown Planning and Development that Jack Robertson um, was leading. Um, a discussion of John Portman's Times Square Hotel, um, which benefited from the Times Square special zoning district. And then the, the chapter culminates with a discussion of um, a really radical and unrealized project from the late 1970s titled The City at 42nd Street. Um, and this was a project that was proposed by Lindsay administration alumni like Jacqueline Robertson, Don Elliott, and Richard Weinstein. And I argue that the project really vivifies the, uh, the administration's ambition to cultivate the theater district as a media ecology through which the city's urban ecology might be repaired. So that's it. I think I'll end there. It was quick so we can have some conversation. Thank you so much, McLean. That was very wonderful and not totally out of the picture. I mean, we cannot talk about New York without its media. Hmm. Okay, well, oh, I've, been, uh, I've been monitor, monitor. We, we haven't we haven't too many, too many questions, but uh, I think the uh, just to to give my own spin on on one that's that's uh, that's all that's already there, uh, a big question I fear, and that is, uh, I think you know it is interesting how you you all of you to some degree go back to the Lindsay administration go you know, and I guess the issue uh, uh, you know the issue is what's what has happened since then that uh, you know. Uh, I think Anna, you're. I think Anna, you're the only one who, who specifically discusses the High Line. And uh, you know, I don't know whether you want to. You know, was that was was that for you a kind of you know part of this golden era, part of something that's that's looking ahead? In other words, just how do you how do you see a more you know this history of 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 the. Uh, you know, the Lindsay administration in terms of what's happening now. Absolutely, yes. I mean, first of all, I would like to I, mean, I would like to explain that, I mean, I'm always looking at New York from a, an outside approach, I mean, an outside perspective. I'm a European looking at New York, and when I first encountered the city, the, it was the, uh, the High Line. They were building the High Line, they were constructing it. I mean, it was still not so much gentrifying. And it uh, and it was kind of this kind of this engine, which really really was appealing to me. But uh, um, but uh, what they wanted to express, I mean, uh, this beyond the high line. I mean, this kind of the the city has. I mean, what they have seen about the city throughout these years, and after teaching here architecture, I mean, from a North American context, is that I mean that it, the city has this. Uh, uh, cha I mean, really, really, it's a, it's an opportunistic city. It's a city that it was doomed 
to not to have, I mean, the life that I mean that it has has had now is a city that it was like really, really highly regulated. And then all of a sudden, uh, contrary with all expectation, is a city that it has taken advantage from this scarcity of openness. I mean, has taken advantage to make the most with the least. Lindsay, I mean, I'm always like very, very surprised from an outside perspective how much is celebrated Lindsay because of really the shift that he introduced in the city. I'm, I'm, I'm always very, very sad. I mean, that nobody talks so much about the Abraham Beam, which I really see that I mean, that is a figure that really, I mean, totally uh, make the city not to sink. I mean, and to really, really uh, introduce and save the city from its amazing deficit that I mean that it had. So I, I find it really fascinating how uh, Lindsay's years, I mean, are really full of expectations, are really full of uh, experimentations. They really, really do, like, I mean, he was really like a very smart uh, figure, uh, mm, surrounded by very, a very strong um, uh, team of, of people who, I mean, who really didn't, didn't know what they were doing and really uh, uh, young and very talented people. But, I mean, they couldn't, uh, continue the dream, they call them continue this, this they, they plant many, many seeds that they have been like, you know, they flourish later. But, but for me from outside, it's really, really interesting. I mean, to read Lindsay from like a two side coin. Okay. Some, some comments from the panel or the audience on, on this? <clears throat> Okay, well, I see that uh, John McMurrow has, uh, has asked quite a, quite a substantive question, if I can, if I can uh, get, it, get it up again. Let's see where, where we are here. Okay, John, if you, are, you, are you here? Are you, uh, I'm, I'm not seeing you on the screen, but are you- uh, I think that we cannot see him, but we can hear him. Okay. John, why don't if you... Uh, sure. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Sorry, I didn't realize this was going to be participatory. Thank you to all the panelists. Super interesting and a lot to think about. And I just wanted to go back to your question, your presentation. You sort of give a genealogy of approaches to public space. You talk about the detail of the Seagram's building. You talk about the policy that it created. You talk about the sort of opportunism of the vacant parks. And then you finally talk about the High Line. These uh, you present historically, and I'm just curious, do you think these are all remain available at any point or are they only opportunities given at certain moments? But what do you mean, John? That I mean, do you mean that I mean that they will, you know, how long they will last in the in the future? No, or, I mean, also... I don't know, like, do the they occur at certain moments within your yeah, story. Yeah. So could we see a new vacant lots program now? Or could we see a new innovation in the treatment of the street wall that would set off a new thing? Mm -hmm. um, is the High Line only possible now and will it go extinct? I'm trying to find out the temporality yeah, yeah, yeah. of yeah, these yeah. categories for you. Do they, once they're innovated, do they remain and, and stay available or do they wax and wane? Yeah, yeah, because I was asking myself the same question. Could have happened the High Line 30 years before? I mean, was the city ready for that formula like that? I mean, it happened when it needed to happen, when there was nothing, you know, nothing left over. I mean, in order to bring something new to the table. I mean, this is, I mean, this is really, really interesting in terms of, you know, uh, mm, asking, asking these questions. I mean, the, the, for me, what is fascinating about, you know, the surround, the, the, this idea of this blurness in terms of the open space, is that nothing is written everything is open-ended and we do i mean and it's always always unexpected what is going to happen and what how is going to be transformed we cannot predict what i mean as even as designers as architects that i mean that we are trained to you know to to ambition what is going to be the next step i mean the true beauty of these spaces or or you know the transformations of those spaces and they are always always they will always surprise us and they will always you know 
are open-ended. I mean, um, we don't know what yet is going to be to to have to happen. I mean, for me, I mean this. I mean because. It's very interesting, I mean, how people were talking about the High Line, that it was almost, I mean, they compare almost with the opening of Central Park. I mean, that you couldn't see so many queues, so many lines in the city waiting for the opening. I mean, it was like almost unbelievable, I mean, for what it was. I mean, that in fact, it wasn't that, I mean, it, they, they compare, I mean, with the, I mean, they compare these two examples, uh, Central Park and uh, the opening of Central Park with the opening of the High Line. Uh, is it, I mean, is it comparable? It's like, you know, can we, you know, but I mean, for me, these kind of key interventions, I mean, almost are a reaction after a big uh, um, catastrophe. We have to imagine that the High Line takes place, I mean, out of the blue, after uh, post 9-11, we, I mean, really, really artificial, after like a, month, an, a really an exaggerated amount of federal funds, and um, with the imposition and with the, with the very unique vision of a uh, little Napoleon, as we said, like after um, Bloomberg. So it's really, really, I mean, it arrives historically after a very unique set of circumstances. I, did, I don't know what could have happened before. It's super interesting, I mean, how Giuliani's last decision, we are not saying that Giuliani now is like somebody that we can rely, but it's very interesting that Giuliani's last decision, being as a major, was to demolish the High Line. I mean, and everybody agreed to demolish it. It didn't because of the, mm, there was no money to pay for ins the insurance, I mean, to do the demolition, I mean, period. I mean, this was, and it's super uh, interesting, I mean, how those artifacts, I mean, are almost like, you know, they, they resist in the city and then they, cel they are celebrated, but I mean, but now we wonder what now, if, they, if that celebration is, is, is really, I mean, if they deserve this celebration, as we have seen that, I mean, it, they have been like this, this point, I mean, to a quick even uh, commodification of that area of the city. So it's really interesting, I mean, to see where, I mean, for me, it's very interesting when happen those projects and when do they happen in the city? I mean, the Seagram, for example, would have not been uh, possible if not after World War II. I mean, when, you know, when the economy will be different, when there was more supply of material, whatever. I mean, it's very fascinating when, uh, you know, everybody has its own place historically. I don't know if this answers your question, John. Okay, so, some more uh, uh, questions from, from the audience. Yeah, in the... <laughs> Uh, I'll uh, just just to, I'll there, there's one one thing you would you would just say uh, uh, <clears throat> Anna you, this was you know this was the first time anyone had mentioned nine nine eleven just now and I I remember Christine in your book that you you kind of regretted that you were unable to really uh, you know that your research in effect preceded that and. Uh, I guess you know. In other words, it, there was a time when it seemed that that you know that the rebuilding of that site would be the test of New York urbanism, uh, and you know it's as if we've kind you know it's it's now at best I think one space among many, and perhaps not among the more the more uh, the more vital ones, and. Uh, I wonder if you or any, you know, uh, or any other from the panel or the audience have any uh, thoughts on what happened there or didn't happen there. Anna, did you want to weigh in on that? No, oh, please, I mean, go ahead. I don't want to monopolize the conversation. No, 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 I, yeah, or Mariana. You should go ahead because I, I was going to take that in a in a little bit of a detour direction. So I'll wait. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm going to take it in a giant detour <laughs> um, <laughs> as well. So, um, you know, I think that um, I think that, you know, like you said, the 
the the cases um i'm sorry i got dogs in the background as well um the case studies took place before um 9 11 and i think that it was more of the same um and i think that a lot of those um conversations and discussions um were distractions from the fact that um, we had started a war um, and we're destroying public and private spaces and bodies in another location. So um, Mariana, did you wanna go and then people don't have to listen to my dogs? <laughs> sure, no, I mean, I think um, that the, the question to me connects to, to a question um, that the discussion of the Highline present did and that I want to tie back actually um, to to McLean's presentation that I think the the 911 sites for me also point to that um, uh, which is absolutely a sort of you know media question and, and part of um, who who is the public of of Manhattan's public spaces you know um, what what is the the intent and and who is who is meant to be served in some of these interventions? I think as, as you're talking about the um, the goals or ultimate outcomes in in rebuilding um, from 9/11 might be um, more suited or um, connected to a larger national appropriation of a certain kind of narrative and need for for recovery and resilience. Um, you know, in the way that. Um, you know, the in the the Highline story, I know you you know you you point to this, and it makes me think about these earlier moments of sort of image export, right? Where um, that project is so um, tied up with the photography and image of the site, and is is sort of always already speaking so far beyond a kind of immediate. Um, community of vicinity or propinquity or, or residency and um for me i mean that that question and and that that geography of a of a public for these spaces we can sort of follow um follow all the way all the way along so i guess i'm i'm curious um you know for for you and i sort of looking at this and originally you know writing it for um um, uh, from the outside, and I guess I say this as, as sitting here with an investment in um, some of the nitty gritty stuff because I have to live, like literally live with the kind of day to day um, crappy parts of, of New York's public space, right? And, um, you know, thinking about um, attending last week, right, a, um, a conversation on, um, you know, new street interventions in Barcelona where literally all the public servants, right, from New York City are like furious chatting like why can't we have this why are things you know so uncivilized and, and backwards here um you know who who are the lessons for um and where are they they sort of meant to 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 travel in this in this moment for me is is a kind of question around um all of these um projects and and it, and, and some of the projects to, to tell their stories as well so i'm i'm curious um where um you know, at this, having sort of looked at this project um, and taken it on from different perspectives, your your kind of current thoughts on that. Well, I know, absolutely. Because for me, I mean, the super good thing about all these testing grounds is that we can always bring and, you know, take a lesson from them. I mean, it's all not horrible or negative, but I mean, but we can always like, you know, bring something to the table and to learn and to learn from them. I mean, I totally agree that, I mean, that all of a sudden the, the, the adaptation of the High Line has been over, you know, valorated here. I mean, has been like, oh, what what, uh, what is this and it's also like almost not ethical the really amount of money that i mean that the city puts like lays some you know all their money here and you know and overlooks i mean what is happening in you know all over the city and how you know how everything is uh, you know how everything is left over i mean but it's also for me it's almost like 
also a very fascinating how the High Line is almost like a nostalgic uh, project. I mean, how the how a city that has been like really really a pioneer. I mean, almost is not, now it's an, a nostalgia from from its own past, and it's almost like a recover. I mean, from the golden years, from all, all those, you know. Mm, I mean, I, it's like a like a city that it looks looks back, doesn't look forward, and we hope. I mean, that New York. I mean, keep looking forward and keep surprising us and keep you know being an open end um, mm, scenario because who? I mean, it's a city that is so uh, dra dramatic in terms of its circumstances. I mean, you no, know, and, and those majorities and those ups and downs, and ups and downs, I mean, those big catastrophes, I mean, with those gigantic deficits and then those like subtle little revivals and then all of a sudden uh, another catastrophe again. That's what, <clears throat> that, that's why I wanted to frame the book between these two moments. I mean, after, you know, a really main crisis, after uh, it, <clears throat> after the 20s, after the, after the uh, post-war situation, really, really, really critical. And then all of a sudden, uh, between this post-9-11, this post which is like, it's super interesting, the amnesia that I mean, that we have. I mean, how re recent, recent in architectural, in architectural terms do, do we do have these ups and downs and how the city recovers once again and once again. But I mean, we have to put on the table, I mean, where is like this, like Christine was saying, where is this in inclusion, this citizenship? I mean, where, are, where the democracy lies? And, um, and he, he, you know, where, where do we stand? I stand with all of this. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. A wonderful point to to end on, unfortunately, because we're out, we're we're out of time. But I think you all join join me in uh, congratulating Anna and uh, one, and and thanking the panel for a wonderful set of responses to an, to an, to a wonderful book. A pleasure, a pleasure and an honor, I mean, to be with all of you guys. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Congratulations, thank you. Anna. Thank you, thank you. So we will celebrate it very, very soon. I mean, we hope we, we can in a few months with a little bit of wine and a little bit of food. <laughs> we hope to see you guys very soon and continue the conversation. Congratulations, it's a wonderful book. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, congratulations. It's um it's really exciting and there's just so much to um to continue to explore. Um thank you for having us. Thank you. It means a lot coming from you guys. Thank you. Your books have been my inspiration.